Hello, ladies and germs. I'm very excited because today I will be doing an interview with MTG artist, longtime MTG artist, Donato Giancola. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. <laughs> so are you working on something for Magic right now? Yes, yeah, new. Uh, I, actually, I have five new Magic cards I'm working on, uh, mm -hmm. which is partly why I missed you the other day, uh, yesterday, because I'm just, I got five to do in three weeks, so. Um, hammer. <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I guess um, I'll start off with um, how old were you when you started painting? Because I read that you you were 21 for, for your first formal art class. Uh, I think it was, yeah, uh, 20, actually. I think I was 20 years old. Yeah, when I had my first uh, guidance over creating art. Uh, up until that point, I'd been a hobbyist fan, just doing it in my free time. And uh, yeah, so that was, and I picked up my first set of acrylics and oil paints. Uh, I think acrylics first, uh, just before that, like a not even a year before I took my first art class. And so, and what? How old yeah. were you when you? I guess when you really picked up the brush for the first time, like it, it must have been young. Oh, and, well, I'm serious. Like I didn't like br like paint. Like I had drawn with pen and ink. Uh, for you know since i was you know with crayons with markers and all of that since i was a kid but actually paint like uh like oil paints or acrylic paints uh i didn't do that until i was 20 yeah 20 21 uh the first classes what drew that, you to do that it was uh i guess a desire to consider art as a possible profession so up until that point i had never considered uh, art as a, a potential career, a career path in my, for future. And I had been studying electronics, uh, engineering, ele electrical engineering at my first university uh, school, the uh, University of Vermont. Wow. Or, so, so actually I was as good in math as I was in art. Oh my but, gosh. But you know, mathematics is like, you know, obviously a better, you know, more, more sensible career than, you know, being an artist, like, you know, because it's, again, where I grew up, we, we didn't, uh, in Vermont, there weren't any real examples of people, you know, there weren't like tons of galleries, there wasn't a pathway that I could see or my parents knew of to be a successful artist. And so um, you did that and then you, you graduated summa cum laude, which is impressive. Oh, well, you know, it's art. So if you love it, it's uh, easier to get A's in art than it is A's in engineering. <laughs> so it's, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, but I did, I did throw myself into my studies at Syracuse University when I was there, yeah. Cause you know, the whole, like um, the whole uh, 10,000 hours thing that's talked yeah. about where you need to put in 10,000 hours to be considered an expert in any field. Yeah, no, no exactly what I'm doing right now is painting. Like, right. All. And yeah, go ahead. And it's um, but it's impressive that you got started so late, and then just sort of like just took to it like a duck to water. Well, that's what I want to say, Aaron. Is that I didn't just start late. I mean, I I have drawings that my luckily my parents preserved from when I was in first grade. So okay, when I was six and seven years old, and I was already blowing all the other kids out of the water with my skills that's what i was that's what i was trying to, yeah. to figure out before because i was like well you must have like started art doing art at a very young age because yeah yeah but but uh, yeah the art so the art i oh again i've been very creative i you know build models do drawings in my free time make dungeons and dragons maps and draw characters but only as a hobbyist you know only as a fan uh, but i did it more than i think any like a lot of other professional artists, like I did it all the freaking time. <laughs> like every free moment outside of, you know, finishing your homework, you know, getting that done. Uh, I was, I was drawing, I was making something. It was like, and my friends can attest to that. Like, I, that's all I did was, was draw and create. How did you get involved with Vincent DeCedrio? Oh, uh, it's uh, Vincent. Uh, so that was, uh, kind of again through Syracuse University, uh, one of the teachers that I had as a figurative painter there. Uh, you know, I was I definitely 
you know, excelled as a, as a painter there. And he took me under his wing. And when I was mentioning I was going to New York City a lot to visit, he said I should look up this other figurative painter, Vincent Desiderio. Oh, I'm sorry, I pronounced it. No, it's okay. It's a, a, my, my last name gets butchered. So I'm not gonna try to correct you. Uh, I, I know exactly what you meant. And so when I came to New York City, I visited Vincent and started uh, kind of t stopping in on him whenever I'd come into New York. Uh, and eventually he asked if I would be interested in being an assistant. What, so. what um, those, some of his paintings are really shocking stuff. There's a lot of um, studies of death um, in them. Were, were you like, w did that shock you at all when you first saw them? No, because uh, I mean, as a kind of a fine artist, uh, they are, they aren't really about death. They, I mean, they, they have figures that are in death states. There certainly are some about death, but it's not about the death that he's portraying. It's about the sense of loss, mm -hmm. uh, the emotional state of those people, the other people, other than like the dead person that you see. So it's, it's a, and, and that's something that certainly persists in what I do now is right. I try to get into the emotional state of my characters rather than purely their actions. There's a, yeah, I've noticed that a lot in your paintings. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of the, the loss, uh, like you were talking about, and also a, it seems like a very um, ominous uh, sort of point of view of the ocean. The ocean in oh, your yeah. pieces are very scary. <laughs> well, the ocean, I think, I don't know if you read through that, but uh, like the ocean for me uh, relates back to my childhood. And uh, growing up in Vermont, the closest, ocean was the coast of Maine. <laughs> yeah. And if you've ever been up in Maine, I mean, it's got very few nice sandy beaches. You yes. Know, yeah. The sea hammers in on sharp jagged rocks <laughs> and it's brutal. It's cold. It's you know always stormy. And uh, so that's the ocean that for me, that's the, that's where the land meets the sea. And it's also teeming with life. Mm -hmm. so even in this brutal environment, you know, you've got life everywhere, sea urchins, sea stars. Actually, I think you can even see more sea life uh, on those brutal coasts in Maine than you will on the sandy beaches in Florida. Yeah, you won't, you won't, not in Florida, right. it's, it's pretty, there's, plus there's so many people, you know. There's so many people, but yeah, but it, the, but yeah, the, like a tidal pool is there, you can see crabs and sh sea urchins and snails and small fish that might stay in there. I mean, it's just, I, I just remember that intensely. And so as an, you know, as an artist now, when I tap into that, if I wanna show the forces of nature and humanity at odds with each other, that, that I turn to that. I turn to that, that really brutal nature uh, that really forms and shapes the world. If you you said that your one of your favorite things to do for for traveling and obviously this is before you know the uh, COVID fun um, yeah. uh, was going to analyze paintings and study paintings, what would you say is your favorite the painting? What one that you've gone back to the most? <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, it, the it's obviously a, a, a fact of convenience is being in New York here, so right. I, I gravitate towards those paintings here in New York. Uh, certainly, the the. Uh, Joan of Arc painting by uh, Jules Bastien Lepage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can send that to you if you want to like show it up. Oh, I, I will absolutely. Anything that we okay. discuss is, is going to be shown because. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. So we can pull it. Yeah, but uh, that's a painting. Uh, again, it's about the emotional state of the character. Uh, it's a beautiful, realistic painting done about uh, 130, 140 years ago by a French painter. And it just captures, for me, everything, uh, the, sense, the wonderful sensibility of na the natural environment, uh, a wonderful portrayal of the character, but it's also you know, a fantasy painting because there's, there's Archangel Michael and another uh, uh, angel behind the, that person. And so, the, yeah, so it's a fantasy painting, right, in a, in a mythological sense. Right, so, yeah, so I, and I, I definitely liked, liked the dichotomy of, of your Jones of Art that I've looked at. There's one well, where she is almost playful in her, where she is at, 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 in her life. And then it's obviously, it's one that's happening, you know, close to the, uh, to the, the, the execution or the burning. Oh, right, yeah, okay. And she looks, you know, very broken and it's, 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 yes. it's interesting. 
well, again, that that's you know, Vincent Desiderio certainly impacted me pretty heavily working in his studio, seeing the way he saw the world, the way he portrayed it in his work. And uh, it took me, I would say, you know, actually, it didn't, I didn't inject his sensibilities like immediately into my work because I was just doing other things technically or problem solving. But when I, I think when I had gotten my technical skills under control or, or at a point, not in control, but at a development where I didn't even have to think about them anymore, mm -hmm. then I was able to open up to more broader interpretations to what I wanted to paint. What was the uh, what was the impetus for for getting involved with magic? What tell us the story oh. of how you got <laughs> your foot in the door there? Well, that was uh, that again fortuitous. Uh, just like uh, the introduction with Desiderio was by another artist. Uh, that magic was introduced to me by another artist, a friend of a friend. I was at a comic book convention in Philadelphia. This must have been in uh, 95, 1995. And uh, we were sharing a table, you know, like an artist alley table with my friend, Steve Ellis, uh, who's a comic book illustrator to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, next to us, a few uh, tables away was this artist and he was swarmed with people and they're all asking him to sign things. And we're like, you know, he, Steve and I are there and there's like one or two people in front of our table. And he's got a lot, this other guy's got a line and, and it was Brian Wackowitz. Wow. Uh, okay. So, so Brian was a magic artist and he was getting, that's when magic, that's my first uh, exposure to the success and popularity of Magic the Gathering. How, how do you handle it now that you're one of the stars? Like, is it, does it, I mean, how does that feel? Well, I don't know if I'm a star. I'm just oh, one of the artists. Are. Well, thank I appreciate that. But it's I'm, I'm just one of the many contributors to what Magic is doing. And it's a real honor to be able to, like I'm working on some new pieces now. Yeah, you guys will see in uh, nine months uh, to a year uh, I mean, that'll be coming out. You've got a secret layer that's pretty heavily based <laughs> around you. I'd say that's that would that definitely puts you in the forefront. Oh, OK, well, thanks. Uh, but again, like uh, uh, going back to like Brian. So Brian, you know, Brian was there and he said, oh, you should send in your portfolio to Magic. They're, they're always, they're looking for new artists. Uh, and so I eventually did. And immediately they threw back some commissions for me and uh, I loved them because they were, I was doing a lot of book cover illustration at first, mm -hmm. uh, at that time, I should say. And Magic offered an opportunity to do fantasy in a different way. Uh, and so I, I really enjoyed embracing and, and working with magic and still do uh, even now. Do you have, um, do you remember your, your first card that you did the first? Oh yeah, you? certainly. I remember, yeah, it was, uh, well, there's a, there's a set of four cards, but I think the first physical card that I painted was Amber Prison. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, I got uh, uh, a person here in, in Brooklyn to pose and uh, I'd actually made a hand painting. Cause I, I normally, I love painting hands, but book covers are always about people and portraits and, you know, full body for the most part. Right. So, so right, yeah, yeah, I still remember very clearly how I assembled the pieces. I went out and actually bought some Amber. Like uh, I went to, there's a, a historical shop here in New York city uh, uh, that sells fossils. So I went out and bought a piece of Amber to use, uh, you know, it's one of those wonderful business write-offs. You can buy something you like and That's still get awesome. the tax deducted because it's used for a business purpose. Right, you're like, yeah. I'm going to draw a, a DVD. No, I'm saying, <laughs> That's true. right, yeah. I mean, I, well, look at, look, I mean, I love, I love this, this, you know, this world. Like, you know, I can go to see a Star Wars film or a science fiction film and take it as a tax deduction. Right, yeah. I, staying on top of the contemporary issues in, in the genre, yeah. Like that's, that's, I mean, that's inarguably awesome. Like yeah. you can't you can't beat that not at no, all. No, no, that's great. So, so that's that's so again back back to like your your question. So that's I rem that's I remember very clearly, uh, magic. And again, it was also that it was the deck for Mirage, uh, that it was. And so Mirage was an intentional. They they said you know, theme it with uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm. you know, theme it with a different cultural feel. And so not only did I buy that mat that that a piece of amber, but I went to a, a book, a rare bookshop and bought this wonderful art book 
uh, that I still have now. Uh, I think it's Angela Fisher is the photographer. Okay. And it's a giant oversized book. And it it's a thematically about the, the dress and jewelry and uh, how people adorn them. It's, I think it's, it's actually called Africa Adorned. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check into that. It's, it's, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a collectible book now. It's like a four to $500 book Damn. Uh, now. Yeah, so it's like weird. Like I bought this book just again for for work, and now it's turned into a collector's item because it's such a celebration of of, of the the cultural experience in Africa. And then the the paintings that you did based off of the collect the, the, that collection are now collectors like pieces in and of themselves. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, certainly. Uh, that's magic has become quite a collectible marketplace, right? I mean that. It's it's insane. I mean, in my, it, it, when did you realize that the, you, with the the kind of um, I guess basically the money that you can make of selling a painting? I mean, when, when did you first like hit that point where you're like, wow, okay, this is this is serious. <laughs> it's funny you you say that. I I was just looking at one of my old price lists for Magic from around the year two thousand, and. Uh, to be honest, Aaron, we almost couldn't give the art away. Then. That's insane. <laughs> you, I know you won't believe it, but I I'll do, show I you this price me. list. And I had the discount of a whole bunch of paintings because no one was buying them. They were like, you know, I had them down to, I think I had Wooden Sphere, which is a fifth edition painting. You know, it's not a great, a great card, but I had it at $150. Oh, okay. And it still wasn't selling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I talked to Chris Muller about it. He said the same thing. He's like, I wish I had known. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> well, again, so so when did it, when did that happen? When did the collectability happen? Uh, I would argue it fairly recently, uh, past eight years, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, when it really started, you know, when, when the price of your artwork could basically be guaranteed to sell more than the commission was. Uh, so that's only a, a kind of a recent phenomenon. Uh, so most of what we did as artists back then, we just had to make the artwork to for the commission. You know, if you got a thousand dollars, that's you know you might be able to sell the painting. You might, you know, I remember selling my drawings for like ten to fifteen dollars, like all the time. Those and are some those lucky drawings. customers. Yeah, they are. You know, again, well, if they held on to them, right? So oh, the catch is, oh, you, you, you didn't flip it, right? Of course, if if you sold it, bought a sketch for twenty dollars, and you sold it for a sold it for a hundred, well, it's like, well, that's an awesome deal. But that that twenty dollars sketch now is probably worth a thousand. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's like you know, it's it's what the market would bear. I luckily have a uh, about ten, almost ten magic paintings still uh, that I was able to hold on to. Uh, so uh, yeah, I still have a nice collection of my earlier work. So what are some of the everything. pieces that you have for your own personal collection? Well, uh, luckily, a Amber Prison. Uh, mm -hmm. I immediately recognized that this was a nice painting and I enjoyed it. And I decided not to sell it. So I held on to that one. Uh, there's a series. I wish I'd... Uh, there's a series of four seers from, I think, Ursa's Destiny. Uh, right. Series of five. That's one for every color. But I actually ended up selling one of them. And I wish I didn't now because now I've only got four left. Um, again, those aren't, they aren't great cards, but they're nice artwork. They are very cool. They're, 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 they're very, um, and I, when I say alien, I don't mean like outer space, but there's something otherworldly. Otherworldly about, about, oh yeah. Yeah, there's, there's severe, they're, they're portraits. So yeah, I, I intentionally tried to make them as like classical portraits. You know, if you took uh, like the 19th century painters like Jean-Dominique Ang uh, as a portrait painter or, uh, or you dial back like to Titian or uh, Lorenzo Lotto, these Renaissance painters. So that's what I loved about magic is that it, again, like I mentioned, it, it allowed me to dive into executing material that I could play with more than what I was doing with book covers, uh, which, are, which are kind of regimented about how the look was for them. Do you have a piece and like that you personally are the most proud of, of your magic cards? Uh, well, actually there's gotta be one uh, I see, I'm looking at it right now, but it wow. uh, hasn't okay. been released yet. So that'll come out. Uh, and, but I, you know, to be honest, it's, it's like they, uh, so much of my work there, uh, 
it's like children you, you can't right. pick a favorite uh there are not like shiv and dragon from the seventh edition set was That's really epic came out great yo you got marari behind you there which mm -hmm. i love uh because that that plays with metallics and architecture two two of again one some of my favorites in, as a painter so there you know there each there's so many different pieces that have characteristics about them the portraits that i mentioned uh cartographer with the maps that's uh, that, that one's from, actually hailed by a lot of people as one of the best in the uh entire uh series of magic the gathering cards period I've oh i know that's very nice yeah i know mike lineman is uh, quite uh, quite a fan of, of that, mm -hmm. that piece. yeah but uh again that that they are uh, again like there's so many great artists that have worked and are working on magic like i don't know how collectors pick and choose uh, it, it, yeah no it, it it's it's the truth and and that actually is um the that brings me to my next question with um vulcan baga how did you uh then Go around and then you became a mentor to him how did that happen and it's it's interesting to me not being an artist of how there's a cycle of take being you know the pupil and then taking on the pupil oh yeah yeah that's uh so voicon had emailed me this was must have been back in like 2003 or four uh and he was interested in uh my art and asking me questions and then I think he asked if I was willing to have an assistant. And I think right at that time, I had just had another assistant uh, with me, uh, Eric Buffard and another guy, Frank McGone. And, and Frank was gone. He had just left uh, the studio. And so I was I didn't have anybody. So I told Voicon, it's like, well, if you want to come, uh, I can. Yeah, you could help me out in the studio and I can show you a few things. Uh, and I have a large enough studio where I've got an extra drafting table and such so he could set up here and work. So he said that he had an uncle who lived in New York and he would he was he was gonna come and uh and and work with me. So when he got here, I found out his uncle didn't live in New York but lived in New Jersey. Oh so he's gonna commute. So Voicon had to commute. But uh but again, he was he was not a you know, I think he was in his late 20s at that time. Uh he had already been working with Sid Mead, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, through like correspondence, like what he was starting to with me. But then uh, Boykon came almost uh, like on a weekly basis. He was here three to five days a week uh, helping out. And then uh, I had him, showed him my technique and showed him the process. And he made his first kind of experiment uh, sample uh, here. And he just killed it. I mean, it was just it, like, I wanted to strangle him because he was so <laughs> good. <laughs> it was like, I, it took me 10 years to get like, to where I am now. And you're like, you get it like in a month, like, bam, like, bam. <laughs> that's, that's that because he, he, he's, he had such awe for you. Um, we were talking about, and I'm curious about the Nameless Day. Um, that's his, oh. one of his favorites. And he, he said he was fascinated by that one. And I am too, because I, I I, I don't, I want to know the story. I mean, what's the, 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 the inspiration behind that? Is it biblical? Oh, no, that, again, that's a, that is a book cover. Um, okay, it is, and, okay. But, you know, speaking of biblical, the, the, it's a fantasy novel, but it's based on a kind of an alternate history of angels and demons on earth. Uh, and, you know, the conflict happens on earth and they're kind of, again, biblical in their structure. You don't really see the demons. You don't really see the angels. So they act through emissaries like people on earth. So that's uh, so that painting, yeah, has a very biblical feel because I was attempting to convey pretty much you know the natural world, the the state of these emissaries, these people, uh, and that person. You the main character in that picture is kind of an angel, an angel's emissary. So it's you know you can almost see wings like projecting right from the radiating from so it's very subtly from the back. Yeah. And there's a sort of like that that ecstasy that that you see yes. a lot in re religious yeah. paintings that people have when they're experiencing sort of the rapture, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, a detachment of the physical world into the mental state. Uh, yeah, again, that's uh, so. Again, it wasn't like book covers. I couldn't do things, but magic also like offered different opportunities. So, so book covers also gave me a chance. For one, they paid a lot more than magic. So mm -hmm. I could spend a lot more time on book cover illustrations than I could on a magic card and and make money 
uh, as a, you know, again, making an artist a uh, living here in New York. How did you land Walmart as a client? Because you you did a lot of book covers for Walmart. And uh... oh, the, yeah, it wasn't even Walmart. That, those were uh, my very first published covers was because a publisher, Tor Books, was managing the publishing for Walmart. So Walmart oh, okay. doesn't really publish. They hire a, th a third firm, uh, a secondary firm, and then that firm hired me to execute those. Yeah. And so when did you, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, we have to talk about this. I'm doing the, your work for Lord of the Rings. I mean, that must have oh. been uh, huge. It was. Uh, well, there's two, there's two phases of, uh, of the Lord of the Rings is that there, I did trading cards mm -hmm. for them. So actually the magic wasn't my first trading cards. It was the uh, Iron Crown Enterprises. Really? Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Back uh so those were so those are my first trading cards were with Middle Earth, and then the commission you might be thinking of the the book cover that I executed for the science fiction book club, uh, that came a few years later, and in part the you know when you're the I don't know if you know that like the Iron Crown Enterprises cards were so low paying. They were like $125 or I think I got them to pay me $200 a card. Wow. Uh, and I remember you, you could barely spend a day on them because you couldn't make a living. Right. I mean, yeah. Eight hours of work at $20 an hour is, there, you know, that's $160. So that's, that's like, you know, okay pay. <laughs> it's not, not in New York city though. <laughs> not, yeah, not in New York city. Right. That's just it. It's like, so I remember doing some of those trading cards, like two cards in a day, just, and that's actually like what early magic was like, right. If you hear about the stories, right. That it was just, you just cranked it out, just had to get it done. So the reason why I'm saying is that is that I did such a horrible job on many of those cards for Middle Earth, the other you know, stories that I love, that when I finally received a commission to do the book cover, I just said, it doesn't matter the price, I'm just going to kill myself. I'm going to throw all my skills into this painting and make it as beautiful, as celebratory as possible for Lord of the Rings. For Tolkien. yeah, it's very, it's it's got that very classical like. Carvaggio is the artist. Yeah, if you're looking for a a, a name, that's uh, who I emulated when I yeah, yeah, very much, very much, very much the Caravaggio going on. Um, I um, I love. Did you now? I I had them stuttering, but have you ever seen Cairo's version of Judith with the head of Hall of Furnace? Cairo, no, who's that? I don't. Um, I might be mispronouncing the name, but I'll put the photo up here. And if I screwed it up, it's because I'm an idiot. But like, I, I, I think that this painting, and I'll send it to you later. I think that that one might beat his version of Judith because I, I got it. It's just uh, his stuff is usually so like, like on point dark. But I feel like okay. she shouldn't have been blonde. I'm just. <laughs> oh, what Judith? Uh, oh, really? Is that what uh, he he? So is this a contemporary artist? You're no, no, about? he was um he was not contemporary. He uh he was also like Caravaggio. He was uh, he had a criminal background, and I think oh really yeah okay. I think that he was also I think he was an actual murderer. Um, wow. I, I saw it at the uh the um museum in Sarasota, the Ringling, and okay. um it's there and uh, it's it's great. And I just I was wondering if you uh, had had seen it, but uh, no, it, I, I, it, I digress. I probably have because uh, I, you know, I've been quite a consumer of historical imagery around again, uh, and so I'm, I'm sure I probably passed by it. So maybe it's the name, uh, or again, I don't remember every artist's work and name, so I'd have to just maybe see the image and get a little triggered to to remind myself. I feel like I feel like you would love it, um, yeah. um, and then uh, where uh, don't worry, I'm I'm almost done with you. You can get back to your painting. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> but um. How did you get involved with Game of Thrones then? I mean, and and is and to follow up would be, is it difficult to to work on stuff where it's connected to the the show had come out and it was gaining mm. such momentum? How do you how do you do that? Uh, how do you do your paintings without worrying about being influenced by the show? Right. And I guess the same could be said for the Lord of the Rings as well. Yeah, Lord. Well, luckily, like uh, the dialing back to Lord, the Lord of the Rings, my that book cover that I executed came out uh, two years or a year and a half before the films were released. 
So luckily I was not impressioned in any way by what Peter Jackson did. Uh, so I was able, uh, again, that dates back also to my history as, a, as an artist, as I read Tolkien, uh, I saw a lot of the artwork and I saw also no one person uh, commanded the ownership of that vision, right? Uh, There's so many, like the Hildebrandt brothers, Daryl Sweet, uh, David Wenzel, who did the graphic novel, Ian Miller did some artwork for it. So there's all these different artists who interpreted Tolkien. So moving forward to Game of Thrones, right? The, that show set, right? Set the stage, right? Like there's no other artists interpreting Game of Thrones except the producers right? Uh, for that. So, but the commission came about because uh, George Martin knew about my work uh, in the field. Uh, he, he had actually collected some of my artwork even before uh, I was commissioned. So he, 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 put, he was put my name on the shortlist for consideration. And they requested that as we interpreted the materials for the calendars, that we intentionally not look or be biased by the TV show. Ah. Okay. So he, yeah, so he wanted artists to interpret from the books uh, our, our interpretation of Westeros, not what was being done with the show. And, and so, the, so uh, that's actually kind of nice. So he sort of gave you uh, like the freedom. He was like, listen, I, I don't right. want you to do that. Yes. So the cat, you know, this is, I mean, there's an interesting time set because I, I had heard friends talking about Game of Thrones but I don't have, we didn't have cable and I never really watched it. And so they kept, I kept just think, you know, the, the show kept coming up in comments and, and everyone referring to it. So I think it was in late November and December of, uh, I don't know, 2013 that I finally said, okay, I'm gonna start watching the show. And so I, I sat down and I think I saw three episodes uh, which are again brilliant. Uh, again, Peter Dinklage and like I mean the whole host Sean Bean, I mean the whole host of characters there, and actors. And then George, then I get the solicitation from uh, the art director and George Martin saying, "Hey, we'd like to have you do the calendar." <laughs> so I immediately stopped watching the show. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Right. So I said, okay. Then uh, I started reading the books. So that forced me. That was great because it got me to read the books. Uh, turned off the TV. And then I, you know, after I'd finished the calendar or I'd, or I'd gotten really moving into it, then I was able to pick up the TV show again. I'm envious of that. I actually wish I had been able to read the books prior to seeing the show because I, I it's just, it's better that way always. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, your imagination, right? F fueling your speculation, the complexity of the novels too, uh, yeah, excels that. But again, they, they did, uh, you know, the first six seasons or so were just brilliant mm -hmm. uh, on the Game of Thrones. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the lack of guidance from the books, the lack of not having a book, uh, really, I think, stuttered and handicapped the final two seasons. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. The, the, there's a lot of, um, a lot of like fighting over that people are, I, 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 had yeah. to, I had to pull out after the Red Wedding. I was very angry. I was- Oh, <laughs> that was brilliant though, right? I mean, I mean that was just- yeah. I was so pissed. <laughs> well, I mean, how, I mean, how great, you know, right? To, to write an, a fantasy heroic novels where you, some of your favorite characters get killed. All right? of like, my favorite characters. <laughs> well, well, you know, like, 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 look, look what, I mean, Tolkien killed off Gandalf, but he really did, right? He like, uh, he can't, he let him come, you know, resurrection again. Right, like uh, Gandalf, yeah, Gandalf sort of had like, I mean, he didn't have his throat slashed at a wedding. <laughs> No, it, it is pretty, but you know what? That's the brute, like Martin really portrayed very effectively the brutality yes. of medieval politics, right? The, like, again, like, uh, you know, I've done a few paintings around medieval combat and, you know, like when you, when you really think about how that works, like you don't push a button and kill somebody. Right, yeah. Right? You step onto the battlefield and you could just as easily die as that person that you're trying to kill. Mm -hmm. And, and you've you got to be... get like, like in breathing different, you know, like get COVID infected distance mm -hmm. to kill somebody. Yeah, yeah. And like, you have to do it up close and personal. There's a no right thing. 
It is, yeah. So Martin like, really, I think, conveyed that wonderfully. He took out the the overly mythologized uh, heroics of fantasy and right. brought it back down to earth and saying, you, you know, there's 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 repercussions, there's brutality. You know, like Jamie Lannister, right, gets his hand chopped off. Mm-hmm. You know, the greatest swordsman of you know Westeros is now denied his heritage denied his skill. He's been literally like castrated by you know, having his hand cut off. Uh, and now he's just another dude. He's just- Yeah, like, he, Martin did, did, yeah he definitely right. did that and it definitely brought the reality of like the whole like, like of incest and this, the nastiness yep. of, of medieval. Uh, yeah, no, it's, you know, again, it's, that's what's so, it's so sad to think of how it, it ended on such a low note, um, you know, the, the final, season because it really was a, a, a very well executed developed you know design wise uh, right the uh, the costuming the architectural structure and just how well they interpreted his narratives you know you had to slice and dice stuff to get it onto the screen but those first six seasons very I thought very effectively communicated Martin's intent and his vision uh, and development and emotional state and complexity of character um, very effectively, yeah. And um, and he ended up getting the, some of your paintings for his own collection, I saw. Oh, yeah, yeah, he bought six of the 12 that I created. He, <laughs> I think his that's, wife, Paris, wanted more, but he said, no, <laughs> that's, six is enough. That's, that, that's good. I mean, that's, a, that's affirmation right there. I mean, if you yeah, that's, a, that's an honor. Yeah, that's very nice of George and, and Paris to, to have bought those. And they got, they got, you know, obviously they got, they, they picked their best, their favorites. They got some great ones. And then I'm curious, Pat Rob was is it the Pat Robertson that bought one of your paintings? Yeah, Pat. Uh, yeah, Pat did a commission. Uh, you know, he Pat didn't buy any of the uh, the Martin paintings because he's uh, public. He's into the book covers and such. But he did commission me to do a short story interpretation of one of George's books, uh, The Glass Flower. I would have never pegged him as an R.R. R. Martin fan. I I just I don't know why. Uh. Yeah, I don't know if it's what 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 Pat Robinson you're thinking of. It's uh, not Pat Robertson, the televangelist, right? No, no, it's not. No, okay. no, not that. Yeah, that's not. That's a different one. Yeah. I yeah. was like, huh, yeah. that, <laughs> that's interesting. I just kind of wanted to know because I was like, wow, uh, that sort of goes against a lot of his his persona. Yeah, no, it's oh no, no, that's different. Yeah, this is a different person. This is a, a private collector who has actually the greatest uh, collection, I believe, of Martin's work. Uh, even actually more, I think more than Martin has. Uh, I think Pat's been able to, to you know, work. You know, he he started collecting Martin before Martin started collecting you know, the, the other work that's out there. Well, that's two very like obviously very two successful Pat Robertson sets. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is. I mean, that that's basically all I had um to had for you today. I appreciate okay. your time. Uh, and um, if there's anything you want to add about uh, anything upcoming, uh, I know that you are under lock and key with a lot of that stuff. But if there's anything right. you can, feel free to do it. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing I can really ma- mention about magic. Uh, but it's been a pleasure to be back. You know, I took a little hiatus for about six years from magic and now I'm back and uh, I've been participating and contributing about three to four images per set. Uh, so it's really nice to be back. And uh, you know, I look forward to when the tournaments are back up. Cause I was just gearing just before COVID I started returning to going to conventions and events for magic and then we're shut down. Yeah, uh, that's got a, That's a disappointment. I mean, I've never been to one. I only started playing in 2019, so I never got to even go to one. And it's 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 got to be a real letdown for you guys as artists because I mean, like that's that's got to be an experience to go there. Oh, it is, and it, and also not not just for us, but for the players, the fans, right, right? right? I mean, it's been. I mean, there's so many magic events that are both from the pre-release tournaments to weekend, you know, nighttime Friday night magic gatherings that are really common. Uh, I mean, having all that really being suppressed and denied is frustrating. But yeah, we'll be we'll, we'll be on the other side of this, so it'll be great to get out there. Maybe there I'll see one you. day be gathering with magic again. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. All right, much. Aaron. Um, and also, um, I will. I've, if you what, how many sets away is this per this this favorite of yours going to be in? Can you say that? Oh, uh, it is. I think it's in after uh, the Kaldheim. So. Um, What's that? It's the the D and D set. Yeah. And is it Innistrad? What's that? 
Is did you, is it Innistrad or is it the? No, I think it, it is the the D and D set. The next one that's coming out. Ah, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll have to ask what it is when it comes out. <laughs> you'll see it. You'll probably you'll, you'll 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 know. It's it's a pretty killer piece. So I, it's my favorite art. I don't know if it'll be other people's favorite art, but that's you know that that's that cartographer like right. I love it. It's a crappy card. <laughs> no one plays with it, <laughs> but it's a great it's a great painting. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. All right, you're welcome, Eric. All right, pleasure talking with you. Nice talking to you too. Have a good day. Well, thank you for watching the interview, and I'd like to remind everybody if you subscribe and comment on any of the videos, it enters you in the competition that we have for each new video. So do that and also like. And until next time, I got a scoop.